Good evening, and on behalf of all of us at Bristow's, I'd like to welcome you to Bristow's Life Sciences Summit 2023. I know we've started a little bit late. Apparently, there was a, a queue at the cloakroom, um, but um, we've got some time to play with in our refreshment break in the middle, so we'll certainly still make sure we finish on time. We're thrilled to have so many of you here with us this evening to explore the topic of personalised medicine in healthcare. Personalised medicine is already shaping our future. Only last week, we saw the happy news that our very own MHRA was leading the way in regulation in this area to approve the world's first CRISPR-based gene therapy for sickle cell anemia. This can be contrasted to the perhaps less headline-grabbing wealth of roles personalised medicine is already playing to facilitate the prevention and diagnosis of disease by harnessing the power of AI to improve patient outcomes. There's no doubt that the, that the idea that prevention, diagnosis, and treatment can be tailored to an individual patient based on information derived from genetic and genomic data offers unimaginable benefits over conventional medical treatment to date, where one strategy basically fits all. But where are the real opportunities in developing this exciting but vast and varied area? And are there any challenges and the cost of doing so? So tonight, we have gathered an audience drawn from the spheres of pharmaceutical and biotech industries, healthcare, medical research, universities, professional bodies, regulators, and the media to explore and contribute to this topic together with our esteemed panel of experts, and I'd like to introduce them to you now. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Roger Highfield, who is the Science Director at the Science Museum Group, which is a group of five museums spread throughout the country focusing on science and technology. Amongst many other appointments on his CV, he's also a member of the Medical Research Council, and he was the science editor of the Daily Telegraph for two decades, and the editor of The New Scientist between 2008 and 2011. He's also got a book out at the moment entitled Virtual You, How Building Your Digital Twin Will Revolutionize Medicine and Change Your Life, a topic I suspect we're going to hear more about tonight. Dr. Sarian Bowers is the head of policy at the Wellcome Sanger Institute, where she provides advice and guidance to researchers, legislators, and policymakers on bioethics, research regulation, and science policy. Sarian has a particular interest in the ethical, legal, and societal issues that arise from the use of genomics in the clinic and the development of new genomic technologies. And she will be explaining the challenges and developments in ensuring equity in personalized medicine. And finally, but not least, our very own Hannah Crowther, a partner at Bristow's, who advises on all areas of data protection and privacy law, helping multinational and UK organisations navigate the changing landscape of EU and UK data protection law. Hannah will be providing us with an insight into the data considerations involved in personal medicine, and she will explore some of the tricky problems she has encountered in her practice. So, let's get on with our evening. We're going to start with a short presentation from each of our panellists, and then we'll have a short refreshment break where tea and coffee will be served, and there'll be a chance to circulate and chat. We'll then have a panel discussion hosted by our very own Alex Danoon, who's the head of our healthcare regulatory practice at Bristow's, and at the end of which, we hope you'll join us for drinks and canapes, or what I like to call proper refreshments. There will be a few polls and surveys thrown in along the way, uh, just to see how our thinking uh, is on this topic is developing throughout the evening. So make sure you have your phones at the ready, if they can be on silent though. And when we put the poll up, you'll need to just scan the uh, QR code there. And I have to deal with a few house, housekeeping matters. We are not expecting a fire alarm tonight, so if the alarm goes off, please vacate the building via the nearest exit. Uh, to minimise the likelihood of the fire alarm going off, please be aware that the Royal Society operates a non-smoking policy in the building, on the terrace and on the forecourt. And if you would like to find the toilets for anything other than smoking, uh, then they are on the lower ground floor with additional accessible facilities behind reception. 
So I think that's done. Let's have our first Slido poll, if we can, please. So if you'd like to just uh, scan the code. What best describes your current view of personalized medicine? And it's all anonymous, so don't be ashamed or embarrassed, whatever your answer is. Let's see where we get to. Ooh, that's good news. You're in the right place. Okay. Okay. Nobody fearful? Neutral? Maybe. Okay. A little bit of fear. Okay, so I think we're broadly excited, which is fabulous given our subject tonight. That's really good. You're in the right place. We're glad you're here. So I think we should kick off. And Roger, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Liz. Well, lovely to be here and honoured to be here at the, uh, the summit. And um, I suppose just to start us off, when I think about um, a doctor treating a patient and taking them on a, hopefully, the road to recovery and good health, I kind of think that in contemporary medicine, they're spending most of their time looking in the rear view mirror because their treatment choices are driven by what's happened in the past about what previous trials on people who might be a bit like you or maybe not much like you in circumstances that might not be anything like your circumstances might work. And they select treatments that way, you know, based on the clinical trial process. And we end up with a one-size-fits-all medicine. And I suppose what I'm going to talk about is how we can actually come up with truly personalized and predictive medicine. Um, AI is part of this vision, but it's actually fundamentally different from AI because it's talking about physics-based mechanistic models of what's happening in the body. And these are multi-scale, multi-physics models um, that can help, for a specific patient, look a little bit into the future. And this is a really common approach already in engineering and so on. And actually, it's got quite a, a sort of long history. Uh, here's a picture of me in the museum with Jim Lovell, who was the commander of Apollo 13. And if you talk to NASA, who, who coined the term digital twin, um, they would argue that the first sort of serious use of digital twins was in saving uh, the three astronauts in Apollo 13. And we all know the story. The oxygen tank blew up most of the way to the moon. Um, and then... One of the uh, uh, team who had actually been uh, disqualified from the flight spent a lot of time in simulators on ground, really trying to crack the problem of how to power up this spacecraft with almost no uh, ampage at all. It's brilliantly uh, popularized in the Tom Hanks movie. Uh, but it's a great example of how analog and digital twins on Earth were used to save this spacecraft. And, of course, the logic behind it was impeccable. You know, why experiment on the live spacecraft when you've got simulators on Earth? And similarly, when you're with your GP and they say, hey, I'll try you on this drug, and if that doesn't work, I'll try you on that drug. And then, okay, damn, that one doesn't work either. Well, you're getting horrible side effects. Here's another different drug. Well, wouldn't it be lovely if they could do all that on your digital twin? So that's really what I'm talking about. And, of course, here's the horrendous book plug. It's all popularized in this book, and I think it is the first book on, the, on this subject with my co-author, Peter Coveney, who runs a big team at UCL, uh, a couple of European projects, has positions in Yale um, and uh, Amsterdam as well. Um, and we sort of take you know, the reader on a grand tour of a lot of science to show how we can come up with personalized and predictive medicine. Now, of course, the, you know, the standard response to this vision is what a load of old cobblers because we are so complicated. You talk to molecular biologists and biologists and doctors, and the idea of mathematically modeling the body 
is um, some of them would denigrate it as kind of a, a sad engineering approach to the problem. Others would just say, well, look, look how complicated we are. How on earth are you going to model this? Um, and what I'd like to do is just to sort of say that it's not a literal down to the last molecule model, although some of them are, interestingly. I want to sort of plant this picture in your mind that if you want to navigate across London, I could give you a super high resolution picture, satellite image of London to get from A to B. But to make it easier, I could give you one of these. And actually, a lot of these digital twin models are about trying to get the quintessence of what's going on in the body without necessarily modeling it down to the last atom, a molecule, just in the same way that we don't need to know the position of every blade of grass in London to get efficiently from A to B. We just need a tube map. And another reason I think I'm confident in this vision is that we're already staggeringly competent at modeling our home world. This is a lovely image of Earthrise from uh, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And we can now use uh, simulation to look a little bit into the future of what threatening weather systems, um, you know, whether they're storms or whatever, doing. We can save many lives by giving advanced warning of a serious, of the landfall of a serious tornado or hurricane or whatever. Now, some claim that if you can model something as complicated as the Earth's climate system, then the brain is of equivalent complexity. I don't think I'd go that far, because I honestly don't think we understand the brain at all. Uh, we can't even define terms like consciousness or intelligence. But I do agree that these are staggeringly complex models, and they are producing useful, actionable predictions. So the vision of digital twins is to do health casting for the human body. And there's a really familiar example of this. You know, we've been doing uh, kind of virtual drug trials in computers for years. My co-author, Peter Coveney, has done uh, several runs of trying to select the right cancer drug for a patient um, using the actual version of the protein that's in their body. So you're picking the right cancer drug for them, and so on and so forth. But there are lots of other examples of digital twin work. So Dennis Dawley of Imperial College and Mariano Vasquez of Barcelona Supercomputing Center have produced a lot of the amazing images I'm showing you here. You can actually produce virtual breath. You can see the acceleration and deceleration of a breath and see how pollutants get into lungs. You know, we can do a virtual sneeze. You know, one of the shocking things about COVID was it how long it took for us to realize that it was an airborne uh, virus and think about it. You know, you can simulate the effects of masks and so on. We got trapped by thinking about randomized control trials when actually we thought about a mechanistic picture of what a mask could do to aerosols. It was a no-brainer that they would be useful. Of course, a really familiar use of modeling is in predicting uh, the spread of the virus across the planet, as we've got here. Um, we can do more straightforward things. Marco Vicaconti of the Universities of Sheffield and Bologna has simulated a virtual human. In fact, in one demo, he can even make his uh, virtual skeleton dance to the Macarena. And he can look at the forces expressed through the body. So if you've got an osteoporotic hip, you, know, you can work out the risk and the vulnerability uh, of breaking that hip. Now, of course, you know, the human brain, uh, I think we're a long, long way from making digital twins the human brain. But again, using that tube map idea, we can map the connections in a patient's brain. Um, and that's been done by Victor Gersa in a Marseille university. And he's used that to plan epilepsy surgery. So in a kind of weak, dilute form, you know, we, we are getting models of a particular patient's brain, and in those cases when drugs won't work, helping to plan surgery to cause the, the minimum disruption to brain networks. A lot of this is brought to life, you know, you need a lot of maths, billions of equations, uh, you need a lot of patient data, and you need something like this. This is probably the coolest um, supercomputer on the planet, Mary Nostrum 4. It's in a deconsecrated church in Barcelona. 
and it's a petaflop machine, so that's 10 to the 15 floating point operations. And we're now entering the exaflop era. And this is what the Barcelona guys use. Uh, one of the engineers there is Yasmin Anguado Sierra, and uh, she's the first person to build a digital twin of her own heart, which is now on display in the Science Museum. So if you go into the museum in the engineer's gallery, I mean, the great thing is, you know, you can, uh, I've got to stress, they don't just look like her heart, they behave like a heart. That's a critical thing. So obviously, you know, heart beats 100,000 times a day. That's easy peasy to show. But then you can actually show the ways of electrical activity as they go over the heart. Um, you can see the muscle fibers in Yasmin's heart contract during a regular beat and so on. You can take a close-up of the flows of blood through a heart, so each particle represents about 500,000 red blood cells. The lighter the line, the faster the flow. And the good news is, you know, her digital twin of her own heart shows that she's got a healthy heart. But again, you can do experiments on this. Um, so uh, in Oxford, um, there have been very cool experiments to show that you can, um, when looking at arrhythmias caused by heart drugs, uh, you'll get more accurate results from human digital twins than from animal experiments, for example. That's uh, Blanca Rodriguez's work. And just finally, um, Peter Coveney has been reconstructing the blood circulation um, of a 26-year-old South Korean uh, woman, Yoon Sun, who gave her body to medicine and can simulate about 100 seconds of blood flow through um, her uh, circulatory system. And of course, the next step will be to start to couple together these different organ systems. Um, anyway, I just wanted to give you a kind of a very quick tour of what's possible. And now um, I should introduce our next speaker, I think, as well. So over to Hannah. Thank you very much. everyone. I don't really like hiding down behind the <coughs> um, podium here, so I'm going to step out a bit. Um, hello. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I am here to talk about the data considerations involved in personalised medicine, and I think it seems a reasonable statement to say that all innovation in life sciences depends on data. But I do think that personalised medicine is a paradigm example of this. It requires very rich data sets, usually about lots of individuals. <clears throat> and a particular aspect of personalised medicine is its ability to implicate not only the individual patient, but also other individuals. So genetic data has very significant privacy and data protection implications for those who are related to the patient. But then also, in order to make realistic pred uh, out predictive outcomes for that patient, you're going to need information about other individuals with similar medical histories, similar environmental histories. So it is these very rich data sets, genetic data um, and, and biological data and environmental data, that um, has meant <coughs> that it is uh, particularly important to think about data protection law. And it also, I think, has meant that many in the in industry have had to confront the sometimes myth that those in the life sciences sector are, in fact, processing anonymized data. And I think that, in particular, when you're looking at something like genetic data, it may, we may all just be need to confront the reality that we simply cannot step outside the scope of data protection law. So with that in mind, I thought that I would consider some of the challenges of data protection law, why GDPR is so often painted as the villain of the piece, and why perhaps that might not be entirely fair. And I also wanted to look to the future at some of the more concrete legal developments which are coming up, and why they give further cause for optimism. So what are the challenges posed by data protection law? Well, firstly, as many of you here may well know, Europe has a very, very broad definition of personal data. Personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable individual. 
And it is this concept of someone being identifiable from the data which has led to a great deal of uncertainty for lots operating in the sector, I think. An identifiable meaning, I, I don't know who you are, but I might be able to work it out. Now, the GDPR gives us some guidance on what we mean by identifiable, but one of the things that they refer to is the ability to single out an individual. And unfortunately, I think that in some ways, this has just led to more uncertainty, particularly regarding row-level data. If I can distinguish, so single out, patient A from patient B, but without really any idea who they are, are they still identifiable? And <clears throat> there is also a sort of a, a particular um, theory, which is quite popular in the EU, and in particular in France, of a requirement for absolute anonymity, which means that no one anywhere in the world can, can re-identify that patient. And that really means that anything that still has a key code anywhere that exists, that data is in scope of data protection law, no matter who is processing it. Now, of course, those sorts of uncertainties may become somewhat irrelevant when you have a very detailed genetic data where it may just simply be identifiable just simply on its own. But I do think that that sort of uncertainty about that fundamental question of whether you're even inside or outside the law does make a lot of people very nervous. The second point that I wanted to mention um, is, and not to get too much into the weeds of the legislation, but Article 9 of the GDPR. Now, Article 9 of the GDPR is the provision that concerns special category data. And special category data specifically includes genetic data and data relating to health. And at its core, Article 9 is a prohibition. It says right there in the law, the processing of special category data shall be prohibited. Now, of course, there are exemptions, and I'm going to come on to talk about them. But I think it is this framing of the, the processing of special category data as a prohibition, which also puts a lot of people in this industry on the defensive a little, a little bit. It feels like, oh, this isn't something we're supposed to be doing, or we should only do it in exceptional circumstances, instead of the reality that this is what we do all day long. This is the core of our whole business. So I think that framing is being quite unhelpful. <clears throat> now, moving on to talk about those incredibly critical exemptions to Article 9, and they are in there, and we all have to rely on them every day. But... I am talking about the challenges here. There are a lot of difficulties with them. They've led to a lot of uncertainty. And one, this is in particular an area, special category data, where there's a real patchwork approach across the EU. There's a lot of discretion left to member states um, to Im impose their own specific extra protections in respect of processing health and genetic data. And then, of course, in the UK, we've now got scope for further divergence. So it does lead to something of a patchwork. Now, there are three exemptions that are worth talking about tonight. But in practice, there probably should only be two because consent is something of a red herring. But we need to talk about it anyway. So the first one, getting the patient or the individual may not be the patient, as we discussed, the data subjects, explicit consent to use their data. And this, for lots operating in, you know, in the sort of medicine, seems totally logical, right? You get the patient to sign an informed consent form. It's kind of, it's, it's what they do. But for those who are familiar with GDPR, will know that in order for consent to be valid under GDPR, it has to be freely given, meaning that the individual has a genuine choice. And this has led most of us to take the view that in a treatment scenario, uh, it's simply not the appropriate basis. Because if my choice is to have my data processed or I don't get treated, then I think we would all agree that that's probably not a great choice. So there are, and then there are some other issues with consent. It needs to be fully informed, which if we move outside of treatment and start thinking about research, risk stratification, product development, it can be very, very difficult to get in front of people in order to explain exactly what you're going to do. Sometimes you don't even know yourself. You're on a journey of discovery. And then consent must also be revocable. So you must be able to withdraw it. 
if the individual withdraws their consent, you have to go away and delete that data, which can be an immensely painful experience. <clears throat> so let's, most of the time, although there are exceptions, let's cross consent off our list. Then we move on to another exception, uh, which is where the processing is necessary for preventative and occupational medicine. Hugely useful, hugely important. This is great. You are allowed to receive medical treatment. Of course you are. You're allowed to process data for that. So you'd think that is really great. But I still think this provision, there's still quite a lot of additional layering in member states, which doesn't make it easy. And it is also, it's very suited to the, I go to a healthcare professional and they treat me. It's not very well suited to a scenario where you have lots of different participa different players, particularly where you have controllers and processors, if anyone knows, is familiar with those terms, where you have um, third parties who are involved in the treatment, particularly med tech, where you know, you've got a, a third party technology provider who's not got that direct confidentiality and healthcare relationship with the patient. Now, actually this, provision does, uh, isn't specific that it has to be the, the patient's data who you're processing. It doesn't have to be the data subject. So you can use this, this in order to process data about X to treat Y. So in that sense, it is quite helpful. But it's still definitely, along with actually quite a lot of the GDPR, it's slightly suited to, I think, a, an older world, should I say. Finally, one of the most discussed and debated exemptions, I would say, is the one that allows you to process special category data for scientific research purposes. Enormously important, enormously helpful to see it included in the GDPR, to see the GDPR recognizing the importance of research. But, again, I'm here being terribly negative, aren't I? Apologies. Um, it does... Um, have its limitations. There is a lot of discussion about what scientific research means. And I think particularly when people are moving into that sort of, oh, well, it's something that I'm doing in my company. Where's that gray, li gray line between research and product development and product improvement? And it can just make people a bit nervous. There are also additional requirements in national laws. So in the UK, it has to be in the public interest. And I think most people are broadly comfortable that what they're doing in the life sciences sector is in the public interest. But I think having to draw these very clear lines and make these very clear decisions that yes, we are comfortable that this is scientific research and that this is in the public interest, otherwise what we're doing is unlawful, makes people very nervous because they're just having to make, take a view Right? You, can't, you can't sort of tick a box and say, yes, I can absolutely be clear that we've met this. You're having to make ultimately something of a subjective judgment. Which brings me on to my sort of third challenge, I think, posed by GDPR. And in some ways, it's also one of the best things about it as a law. Um, GDPR is a principles-based law which in some ways is brilliant. It means that it stands the test of time a lot more than other laws. It's able to adapt to these amazing new discoveries like personalized medicine, like AI, in a way that other more prescriptive laws simply are not able to. And I hope, this is sort of slightly off topic, but I really hope that if we do end up regulating AI in the UK, we take a similar principles-based approach. I think it's really, really good. But, if you are an industry with a traditionally quite low risk tolerance, being given these broad principles with a lot, huge amount of subjectivity as to what they mean can make people very, very nervous. So to take one example, per, the processing of personal data must be fair. That is one of the first principles of the GDPR. And that raises an awful lot of questions, particularly when you're talking about genetic data, whether that is fair for the patient, whether that is fair for their family members, their children, what does that mean? And, you know, you have to take a view, ultimately. Another principle is the principle of data minimization. So you should only process as much data as you need. But in a circumstance where the more data you have, often the better the outcome for the patient, again, you're having to take that view on something which is sometimes just a grain of sand, right? It's the difference between the heap of sand. How much data is too much data? And then, 
A final example is that if you want to reuse personal data, that new use must be compatible with the original purpose. And I mean, even I, and I've been doing this for 12 years now, I have always struggled with the concept of what is compatible with the old purpose and the new purpose. I think it's a very, it's just a difficult and confusing word, in all honesty, talking about compatibility. So those are the challenges with data protection law. And I do appreciate I have painted a fairly bleak picture there, and I do apologize for that. But I am generally, I would say, quite a sunny person. And also, as people who will know me will know, I am a massive fan of data protection law. I think it's absolutely brilliant. So I'm now going to uh, give you some words of reassurance and talk about things which are a little bit more positive. So first of all, I do think that a lot of the challenges that I've talked about are to do with the fear factor of GDPR and some uncertainty there. I feel like there aren't that many laws which have struck more fear into the hearts of more businesses, possibly for, you know, through sheer uncertainty, through sheer not knowing. In fact, I would say that there is a lot about the GDPR that does allow you to do these things, that is flexible. It is deliberately a principles-based law to allow you the flexibility to do these very exciting advances. And there is a lot in the GDPR that makes it very clear that the framers had no intention to stifle innovation. They wanted to support research. They wanted to support data, sh data flows even within Europe, admittedly, but, you know... Um, you know, there, there is a lot of really good stuff in there. And I think you only have to look back a few years to the pandemic when we saw the data protection authorities absolutely bending over backwards to reassure everyone that data protection should not be a barrier to innovation, to data sharing. So, and then finally, I thought I would talk about some of the more concrete legal developments which are on the horizon, which I think improve the position further. So the first one, and I do hesitate before I accept this, but is the new UK Data Protection and Digital Information Bill, which is expected to come in next autumn. Now, I am, this is why I hesitate, I am not a proponent of the Brexit dividend. And in all honesty, I think there's a, I think the whole bill should, is, you know, is very frustrating and I'm not a fan of it overall. But I have to accept that there is some changes coming in that bill which will make life easier for the life sciences sector. So in that way, yay. Um, <clears throat> the first one is that it will amend the definition of personal data. And the way it is drafted is horrifically complicated in about six parts. It's way worse than GDPR. So, you know, don't... <laughs> I, I know, I promise, it's awful. Um, subsection A and B and C, anyway. But what it does is confirm um, what is often referred to as a subjective test for identifiability, meaning that you only have to look at whether the data is ident identifiable from your perspective and from the perspective of someone who might reasonably likely to have access to the data. And that's really great because it means that you're no longer sort of tying yourselves into knots, thinking about theoretical risks of random people in the world ever being able to work out who this data is. So I think that could be a really positive change and put some people in a much firmer position in terms of is this data inside or outside the scope of data protection law. Doesn't necessarily help if you have a full genome. Sorry. <laughs> The next change that the law will do is that it will specifically codify that scientific research includes commercial research and privately funded research. Now, I think most of us would have told you that that was the case already under the GDPR, but I think it's really good to have that confirmed and it puts paid to lots of the sort of skeptics and the questioners who were asking about that. Turning a little bit further afield, uh, we also, in the EU, we have a very interesting court decision coming up. So um, earlier this year, there was a decision of the EU General Court, which is the highest court that thinks about um, the 
it, it adjudicates on the acts of the EU bodies. Very, very, anyway, they held in a case, they again affirmed this principle of subjective identifiability. So it was a case totally unrelated to life sciences, but it was about Deloitte getting some data from a European body, and it said, all you have to do is see if Deloitte can identify the data. And they couldn't, so great, not personal data. Now that decision has been appealed to the CJEU, but if it is confirmed, that would again be really helpful in sort of pivoting us towards this subjective test and that you don't have to push towards absolute anonymity. If it goes the other way, bad times again, but sorry. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about um, was the European data health space. Uh, regulation, which is a new initiative to allow data sharing between organisations. It puts in place a framework to allow organisations to request data from data access bodies and from the organisations themselves for research purposes. And it's trying to address some of the issues that I talked about earlier, where we had this sort of patchwork approach across the EU, and that led to a lot of difficulties, particularly with any sort of cross-border data sharing. And so the EDHS is really trying to remedy that. Now, there have been quite a lot of criticisms of the law. Uh, it doesn't do enough to protect IP, I think most people feel. And it's a little bit analog, so it is very, I go to a body and I request the data, and then they give me a data access permit, and they can take two months to do that, and then they go and get the data, and that can take another two months, and all of this can be extended. And then So it's all a bit slow and a bit analog, and I don't think it reflects the reality of, again, controllers, processors, organizations trying to pull data and just trying to do things quickly. A lot of the situations that we talk to is where someone who is, say, providing medical technology that wants to repurpose that data, it's the healthcare provider's data, the healthcare provider wants to, you to, is happy for you to do that, everyone's happy for you to do that, but it's not that kind of sharing data, it's just taking data that belong to the, the clinic um, but is in the hands of the, the technology, you know, of the med tech. So and it, doesn't, it doesn't really work for that. It's a very, like, party A gives the data to party B. But it is a start, and the UK does look like it's going to be part of that. So I think it is still a good news story. Um, that was everything I wanted to cover. Um, by sort of a conclusion, I think, as you can see, I have to accept, notwithstanding my great... Affect, uh, affection for data protection law, that it does some cause some challenges, um, but I don't think any of them should be blockers for personalised medicine. Um, I think that they just require careful navigation. So, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, so, I'm Sam Bowers. I'm head of policy at the Wellcome Sanger Institute, so probably a slight gear shift from where we've already been. Um, I won't be quite so arrogant to assume that you all know what the Sanger Institute is. Um, so we are a genomics institute based just outside of Cambridge. Um, we use genomic technologies at massive scale to improve understanding of biology and health. So we've been around for about 30 years. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary. We were originally founded for the Human Genome Project. So that was obviously sequencing one human genome. That was seven organizations around the world. The, um, the UK participated through the Sanger Institute. We, we sequenced about a third of it. So we were the largest contributor. Um, since then, we've gone on to, um, if you think about sort of how instrumental that one genome was, we have gone on to develop a research program and we are producing data at massive scale at this point. We work on a range of different issues, so we work uh, on, we're studying uh, every single cell in the human body, we're individually sequencing cells in order to build up a map of what the body looks like, so if you imagine Google Maps, this is effectively allowing us to see every single organ at the individual cell level. If you think about Google Maps, that's basically seeing every single house in a city and understanding how that organ is built up of individual cells. We're, um, we're using genomics to understand rare disease, uh, which the oxymoron, of course, about rare disease is it's extremely common. So we are providing diagnoses for children with rare disease. 
Um, and we're trying to use that to understand common disorders as well, like IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome, which have quite complex uh, genetic patterns. We're looking at uh, healthy aging um, and looking at cancer. So I think most of us will know about the link between genetic mutations and cancer. So BRCA causing breast cancer is the, is the common one. Um, but we're, we've taken it to the next kind of uh, level, and we're looking at uh, these combinations of mutations. So several of us sitting in this room right now will have mutations that are typically associated with cancer, and yet we will not have cancer. We will be perfectly healthy. And so we're trying to understand what it is, what are the mutations that we accumulate through our lives that result in uh, tipping over into cancer. Um, we are... Also, we monitor, uh, we do pandemic surveillance. We monitor, we look at the interactions between pathogens and the host to understand that. We look at antimicrobial resistance. We um, have most recently started a program to uh, look at, to effectively sequence all the species in the UK. So if we've got one reference human genome, that has spawned an entire medical industry. Thinking about what you could do with all the species in the UK. That's everything from conservation through health. Um, the implications are enormous. Um, and our most recent program, which is still being set up, um, is looking at um, AI, using AI to predict gene function and um, creating artificial genomes as well. So this is all massive data production. Um, and we, as a uh, not-for-profit research institute, we are committed to data access um, and open access. So this, all of this data is available to the research community. Um, we actually f were instrumental in two principles called the Bermuda Principles and the Fort Lauderdale Agreement, which effectively puts the human genome in the public domain. It's, a, it's public good, um, and it commits us to rapid data release as well. Um, during COVID, we were able to continue our sequencing, and we actually pivoted our sequencing fleet to sequence COVID. Um, so we were taking all of those samples from the Lighthouse Laboratories and sequencing them. So to give you an idea of the scale of the data production that we're doing at the moment, we sequenced, um, we were sequencing around 64,000 COVID genomes a week. Uh, and we continued to sequence UK Biobank at that time, so that was 250,000 human genomes, and we continued our research as well. So we, that's the level of data that is being produced and is now out there for researchers to use um, and access. Um, which brings me on to this. So this is a not brilliant map, because I can't use Tableau very well, but... Um, this is looking at all the data access agreements that we have signed since 2015 and where they got sent. So obviously human data is under a managed access process. We can't just, you can't just go there and download it. You have to apply for it and we do try and we ensure that the people who are applying to access that data are bona fide researchers working at legitimate research organizations or hospitals. We do allow companies to access the data as well um, as long as all the research proposals fit within uh, the usage restrictions based on those data sets. Um, but what you'll see on this map is quite a lot of white, um, and these are areas that have never accessed data from us. Um, and you'll see that even where there are blue, so we've got some blue over um, South and Central America, we've got some blue across Africa um, and Southeast Asia, and yet those are pretty tiny numbers. Um, and this has been bothering me for quite some time. Um, I think it really highlights a huge imbalance in capacity um, and you know it I think it's quite concerning it speaks to a real future issue around how we're going to bring personalized medicine to the world because at this point that's not personalized when most of the world can't actually uh, use it um, so we have done a bit of research about why this is um, it's certainly, I wouldn't quite call it scientific research. Um, we ran some surveys with um, some African partners. Didn't get a huge number of results, you know, a huge amount of feedback. But the general consensus really was that um, there are two reasons why our, access, our data isn't being accessed. The first is that our databases are basically full 
of white European ancestry data, and that's just not of interest to the majority of the world population. European ancestry is a minority population in the world, and yet it's basically what is in all the genomic databases. Um, and the second uh, issue was around uh, effectively equity. Um, there was a sort of perception that uh, Northern, Global North organizations would not provide this data if it was asked for, and also difficulties around handling the legal processes and technical capabilities as well around download speeds. So we've been um, trying to address some of these issues. Obviously, we're one institute, we can't fix everything, but we can try and make some of the, we can try and address some of these problems. Um, I'm also quite lucky that um, I have been given a fair amount of latitude and scope at Sanger to take on projects that I see value in. I'm not sure if this is just, they know if they, if they agree to it, I'll go away and stop bothering them. But um, I started a project um, just after the pandemic uh, to look at equity in collaborations with low middle countries. Um, but at the same time, during the pandemic, I read a book called Invisible Women, which I think some of you will have read, and I thoroughly recommend if you're interested in personalised medicine, I think this book is critical reading. It really highlights the dangers and the problems of data gaps. So effectively, we have not studied female biology. Um, women are generally not included in data collection and the harms that that causes. And I think when you think about that and then look at this map and think we're not gathering data, you know, those countries are not participating in genomics, you suddenly realise the scale of the problem. Um, so with the Equitable Collaborations piece, we, this was really about our partners in low middle income countries and trying to think about how we can work with, with we can, especially on rare uh, neglected tropical diseases, which we do a lot of work on, how can we ensure that we are behaving in a way that supports the collaboration, supports our academic partners overseas, but also potentially strengthens their capabilities and their capacities? Um, and this has been a really quite challenging piece of work. Um, we did a lot of consultation, and I think it probably won't surprise people that the things that bother people in, in some of these under-resourced settings are not necessarily the things that we're spending a lot of time worrying about in, in sort of the global north settings. We spend a lot of time, you know, they're bothered about the lack of administration, and they're bothered about, you know, getting legal capacity to be able to sign agreements. Those are the things, kind of things that are really bothering them. And so we are looking at improving our contracting processes so that we can make it easier for people to access our data. Um, it's difficult to do anything about download um, capacities. But again, as we start thinking about things like the European Health Data Space, we have federated systems. Increasingly, it's bring your analysis to the compute, not the other way around. Um, so most recently, we have brought out some guidance for our researchers on how to try and do um, equitable collaborations. It's not easy, but um, we're focusing on uh, establishing the partnership in ways that are fair, uh, funding and negotiating contracts, working together, so ensuring that actually you're, you're working in partnership and it's not just get your, you know, get your local partner to get you a load of samples and then ship them over to the UK and we sequence them and then we might let them have the data later. You know, that is, we have to kind of end those kind of practices. Um, strengthening research capacity, I think, is really critical. We need these countries to be able to, to participate in genomics. And there is a huge inequity there. Um, there's an enormous issue around reagents, and a lot of these contracts and deals with, re, um, with sequencing companies are prohibitively expensive, more expensive than they're charging in, you know, in the UK and the US. Um, and then our final bit was around finishing research projects, so not just leaving things hanging in the air. Um, and trying to ensure that there's actually benefit locally on the ground. Um, so at the same time I was doing this work, I'd read this book, Invisible Women, and I bored everybody stupid um, with my um, bit around the lack of diversity in our data. Um, and Welcome, who are our parent organization um, and core fund us, uh, clearly we're thinking along the same lines because our next round of funding came through with a condition that we had to develop a strategy to address in their words, representation, diversity, and generalizability of our research. Um, and having 
having bored everybody stupid with my views on diversity and data, of course, I immediately got handed this project and told to sort it out. So um, classic, careful what you wish for. Um, so this project, if the, if the equity and collaborations piece was challenging, this has been really you know, quite a taxing project. But I think we're, we're making good progress with it. The concepts of representation, diversity, and generalizability all have specific meanings, and they're not necessarily uh, compatible with each other. Particularly, representation and diversity can actually mean different things. So, for example, it might be very, very representative to study a Bangladeshi community in East London. That is not diverse, but it is a representative, you know, if they're an under researched group. So, it's an important thing. As a result, we focused on developing a representative research strategy, um, and that will allow us to address things like diversity if that's, if that's what's needed within a project. Um, it also allows us to address things like equity um, and, again, the generalizability. And effectively, what we're saying is that um, we will be taking a very high-level approach that allows our researchers to decide for themselves what representation looks like in the context of their own research. But the Institute will be trying to hold itself accountable to, for developing a body of research that is more representative of the world that we see around us. So whether that's studying particular communities or whether it is uh, working in, in geographical areas and trying to address issues like this, um, I think you know, we will be trying to do all of those things. Um, Effectively, we will be looking at our scientific strategy. Um, we'll be looking at sample collection and cohorts, data analysis, and the outputs and impact of our research. So we're looking across the entire uh, life cycle of our research. Um, and I hope we will be producing this strategy next year. And I really hope that we will start to see a bit of a shift in some of this. I think Sanger has got some good practice here, but trying to improve the diversity of our data and you're trying to shift this kind of issue, I think is really critical for everybody working in the life science sector at the moment. Um, so I realize I've been talking a lot about Sanger um, and it may not seem directly relevant to personalized medicine, but we're really, you know, we are producing those foundational data sets. These are the data sets that will go on to make, that companies will pick up and other researchers will pick up and will go on to make discoveries. And we, like all the other, you know, people at working at this very very discovery end of research up to the sort of beginning of translation, I think have a responsibility to try and do better on, on making our research representative and think more about what the questions we're asking and who are we studying. Um, Realising personalised medicine really requires us to have data that covers humanity, uh, and we don't have that right now. We don't even have data on 50% on of the population at the moment in many areas. Um, and we need to build that capacity around the world. I don't think you can have personalised medicine if only a few countries are able to, to actually do it. Um, however, it's not enough to just say, you know, collect the samples, study people. You know, this is an incredibly challenging area. Um, there are real historic issues around scientific racism and eugenics. Um, and the damages, you know, the inherent biases within modern medicine that I think we have to be honest about that, you know, have harmed communities and that there are minoritized and, and underrepresented communities who legitimately have concerns about medicine. And we have to listen to that, I think, and we have to, um, we have to try and engage with them where they're at rather than sort of just trying to persuade them that this is for their own good. You know, I think we know that promising benefit is just not sufficient to engage with these communities. So we are going to have to do, I think, quite a lot of work to get there, to get that representation and to, to eventually shift this map. So thank you. <laughs>